Welcome. We are coming to you live from Santa Clarita Valley in beautiful Southern California. It's the 2020 Economic Outlook Forecast. Now here's your host, Holly Schroeder, President and CEO of the Santa Clarita Valley Economic Development Corporation. Welcome everyone to the 2020 Santa Clarita Valley Economic Outlook. On behalf of the Santa Clarita Valley Economic Development Corporation, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's conference. 2020 has become an unforgettable year with dramatic shifts in social dynamics, our use of technology, consumer behavior, education methods, and work environments. Never before have we been so aware that we are in a global interconnected world. For those of us at the Santa Clarita Valley Economic Development Corporation, 2020 is also memorable because it is the 10 year anniversary of our organization. On December 31st, 2009, SCV EDC formally incorporated. In 2010, the organization took shape thanks to a group of leaders who had a vision for the Santa Clarita Valley, a place where quality jobs are available for residents, a place with a resilient economy, a place where our quality of life is maintained while we grow. This group knew that for economic development to work in the Santa Clarita Valley, it had to be a collaborative effort. That's why the EDC is a public-private partnership. SCV EDC is a team that represents the many players involved in economic development. Our landowners and developers, our brokers, our business service providers, our academic institutions, and our municipal governments. We all come together through SCV EDC to create a vibrant future for the Santa Clarita Valley. We led the charge out of the financial crisis and will lead the charge going forward from today. SCV EDC's team targets business clusters of aerospace, manufacturing, digital media and entertainment, bioscience, technology and headquarters professional service companies. These clusters are our priority areas because they grow our regional economy and provide career options for our residents. Over the past 10 years, we have seen companies expand in the Santa Clarita Valley in all of these sectors. Corporate headquarters like Sunkist, California Resources Corporation, and Logic's Federal Credit Union. Aerospace companies like Chris Air, Adept Fasteners, and Spencer Aerospace. Biotech pioneers Nusano and Avita and so much more filming support, supported by an explosion of soundstage space driven by the vast increase of demand for viewing content that has only grown in the past six months. These are just some of the successes for the Santa Clarita Valley in the past decade. In honor of our 10 year anniversary, the SCV EDC team would like to share 10 things that you need to know about the Santa Clarita Valley. We find ourselves in an environment with great uncertainty. 
Today's event is designed to provide multiple perspectives on what the future holds and what factors to consider as you make business decisions. Our speakers have been selected to prompt your thinking as you guide your companies into the future. Our first speaker is Eric Willett. Eric is CBRE's Director of Research and Thought Leadership for the Pacific Southwest Division, where he oversees the region's delivery of forward-looking insights spanning all major property sectors. His innovative research describes the region's evolving commercial real estate landscape. Eric is an experienced researcher with a deep knowledge of real estate markets and a proven track record of successfully leveraging data to assess industry trends. Eric graduated magna cum laude from Yale University with a Bachelor in Arts in Economics and is a Robert C. Bates fe Fellow. Eric, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you, Holly, for that introduction, and I'm excited to join you all virtually for this discussion about how COVID-19 is impacting the commercial real estate environment nationally and then, of course, in our region of um, Southern California. As Holly mentioned, I work with CBRE, where I lead our, um, our research and thought leadership teams for the Pacific Southwest. And our position as the world's largest brokerage firm and the world's largest commercial real estate services firm broadly gives us a unique vantage to observe the changes underway as COVID-19 um, moves forward and as it impacts the commercial real estate environment. So I'm excited to share our perspective on those trends with you um, this afternoon. Before I dive in though, I want to sit a moment with the magnitude of the shift in the way we interact with the built environment around us that COVID-19 has caused over the last six months. Shown here is Google mobility trend data, literally tracking um, the movement of individual cell phones. And in the midst of, in the course of one month at the beginning of the pandemic, from March to April, our patterns of, of daily life changed dramatically. The share of time people spent outside of their homes dropped by a quarter. That's this dark green line on top of the chart, um, dropping to a quarter. That was largely driven by a decline in people going to work, um, the light green line, and people shopping at restaurants and, uh, or shopping at stores or going to restaurants. That's the light blue line. And now six months later, almost six months to the day from when uh, many of these social distancing restrictions were first put in place in Cal uh, California, many of those patterns have moderated but they've persisted. Today, still, we are spending 12% less time outside of the home, and very few people are going to the workplace or going to, to stores. That's 30% below where we were back in January pre-COVID. And I highlight this to, to suggest that a change of this magnitude, a shift, a forced shift of this magnitude inevitably has ripple effects on the commercial real estate environment and durable um, impacts on the commercial real estate environment. And those are the ones that we're starting to see emerge from where we are here in September. The shift has occurred across asset classes. COVID-19 has changed how we work, how we shop, and how we live. Today, I'm going to be speaking with you most about how we work, what the shift in the office place, the workplace has been. Um, that's something we at CBRE spend a lot of time thinking about, and I'm excited to share some research that we've done on that sector. But in addition, we'll talk a little bit about how COVID-19 has changed the retail landscape and the residential landscape, um, both areas that have been impacted over the last six months. So let's dive into the workplace. And it's important to remember that work from home is not a new phenomenon. And the work from home experiment has been something that was growing rapidly before COVID-19. From 2004 to 2018, in those 14 years, the number of employees who worked usually at home grew, it almost doubled, grew by 80%, vastly outpacing the growth in workers in a traditional workplace setting who usually worked at the workplace. That grew by 15%. In the middle was this flex work where the employees sometimes conducted work at home, sometimes conducted work in the office place, which grew at 38%. All that's to say that a work from home, the, the adoption of remote work is something that was occurring before COVID-19, but accelerated in dramatic magnitude as a result of the pandemic. And of course, where we sit today, we're still in the midst of this massive work from home adventure, um, this virtual experience of engaging with the office. CBRE manages several million square feet of real estate throughout greater Los Angeles. Um, and before COVID-19, happened and, and, and entered the United States and persisting throughout the pandemic, we've tracked closely actual utilization of the occupancy. So real physical occupancy um, 
foots on the ground, key card swipes, the number of cars in the parking lot to estimate what actual utilization of the office buildings we manage is. And consistently, since the beginning of the pandemic, less than a fifth of the normal workforce has been entering the offices we manage. It varies a bit by product type. High-rise office currently is 90% below normal, whereas suburban low-rise office, perhaps that, that doesn't have an elevator or um, that's easier to access without some of the social distancing challenges that high-rise offices present, has been more like 18 to 20% of normal occupancy. But overall, we're still talking about small numbers. We're less than a fifth of the office workforce of Los Angeles has been showing up to work in a physical office environment since COVID-19 has occurred. And of course, all of this is occurring because of the social distancing requirements of the virus and um, the restrictions that um, the state of California and municipalities have, have created. In the midst of this work from home experiment, CBRE embarked on an effort to figure out what the impact will be going forward. How do we expect COVID-19 to impact the office of the future? In order to figure this out, we conducted a survey with 130 corporate real estate executives at um, large firms that we work with across the globe. These 134 firms represent 20% of the Fortune 100 and roughly half of the survey form firms were Fortune 500 companies. So broadly speaking, these are large companies with substantial workforces and as a result, also very substantial real estate footprints. And what did we learn? Well, first we saw that COVID is clearly accelerating a trend towards remote work. In the pre-COVID times, 63% of these companies that were surveyed didn't have remote work as part of their corporate real estate strategy. But there's been a dramatic flip. Today, looking ahead to the future, these same companies report that 70% of them see remote work as in some way, shape, or form being a part of their strategy. And perhaps even more dramatically, only 10% conclusively say that there will be no remote work strategy for their company. And of course, this evolution, this explosion in remote work has pushed companies towards a more fluid workplace model. 61% of companies surveyed in, in, in this survey responded that they expect their employees to have some level of optionality in where they work, being able to choose between a workplace that the company um, rents or leases or owns and their home environment. Um, that's a massive increase. That's a 20 percentage point increase from where these companies were pre-COVID. A really dramatic change in the way companies perceive the use of workspace for, um, for their employee base. And the end result of this is that we're seeing that COVID has accelerated a trend towards a hybrid workplace model. If you think to the traditional workplace model, it was hierarchical and there were corporate users that had discrete but complementary strategies to fulfill their needs. Whereas the workplace of the future is embracing, and, and, and this is one that's emerging right now in, in the COVID times, is embracing a much more networked series of office or working environments, uh, several different workplace modalities that interface and overlap in interesting ways. So let's take, for instance, Joe Worker, a, a, an average office worker. In the traditional model, he likely showed up to the same office every day in a week. Um, his office routine was very routinized. And maybe when he moved from one city to another or he moved from a city to the suburbs, he shifted to a satellite office. But broadly speaking, his pattern shifted with him where he would, where he would show up at the same office, likely the same desk or, uh, or um, actual physical office every day. In the new model, the model that we see emerging today as a result of COVID-19 and other trends in the office marketplace is Joe Worker's routine looks very different. Every day probably is a slightly different model. Maybe one morning he is working, he starts work at a cafe before logging into a remote meeting. And then after that, perhaps he um, goes in in the evenings to a flexible working space environment for project meetings or meetings with clients. The, the office of the future that we see emerging embraces all of these modalities and gives the flexibility to workers and to, to employers to, to modulate as they see fit across the needs of a project, a client, or their employee. As a result of this evolution, there's a growing acceptance among corporate real estate executives of flexible workspace solutions. Flexible space is a term we use to broadly describe a range from co-working space to serviced offices, broadly companies like uh, WeWork, Convene, 
um, or HANA. And this has always been an element of corporate real estate strategies, but it has been increasing and growing partially as a result of COVID-19. 73% of companies say that moving into the future, flexible space will play at least some role in their corporate real estate strategy. And while many companies have had this flex space as part of their strategy before, 30% say that they are looking to increase their use of flexible space moving forward. Again, to give both the corporation and their employees some level of scalability, some level of flexibility in their, in their working environment. And as a result, by, by necessity, the physical environment of the workplace is going to look different. Think back to Joe Worker, our, our, our average office worker. Before COVID, he likely had an assigned desk or an assigned office in a building. In fact, 58% of the companies we surveyed indicated that they had a mostly assigned workplace environment. However, moving to the future and thinking about the post-COVID workplace, only 18% of companies report that they are looking to have a mostly assigned environment. Instead, many are transitioning to some level of free addressing that gives employees the flexibility to choose where they are sitting, both very concretely, but also to choose where they are locating to do their work at any given time. As we think about the future of the office, Many have speculated about the relationship between CBD, dense urban office space, often high-rise office, and the periphery or suburban office, um, wondering what the relative impact of COVID-19 is on that. And at CBRE, we have yet to see any suburban shift materialize. The data shown here on this slide is um, from an internal survey of leading office brokers nationally. And it, as of August, 0% of them, zero brokers reported seeing any actual leases signed that indicated that companies were shifting workers to the suburbs or, or creating additional office space in the suburbs to accommodate employee flexibility. And beyond that, on the other side of the ledger, about half said that they are neither having conversations with clients nor do they anticipate having conversations with clients about this suburban shift, that they don't see this as likely to materialize. All in all, the impact of COVID-19 on the workplace looks to be one of accelerating several trends that were present pre-COVID, but have really been um, supersized in some ways by the pandemic. One of those is remote work. Companies are increasingly looking to remote work as one element of their workplace strategy to give employees the option to work from home at least some period of the work week. Another is fluidity, giving employees some, some level of flexibility to choose their work environment on an ongoing basis and to adjust as the nature of their work um, demands. Of course, also is ad adopting flexible work um, workplace solutions and using flex space as one ingredient in, um, in, in terms of a broader workplace strategy. Collectively, these trends describe an evolution towards a hybrid office place, one that is closer to what the employees of today are demanding. And I think it's important to say, as we speak about office, that despite polemicists that are heralding the end of the office space um, as a result of COVID-19, the data simply does not support that. Um, when we speak with corporate clients, they continue to embrace the office as a site of corporate collaboration and corporate community, and they see that continuing into the future, even as the pandemic subsides. Now, pivoting to retail, much like office, the pandemic has accelerated several trends that were present before COVID. Most notably, this has been the massive divergence between online retail or e-commerce and traditional brick and mortar retail. You can see here Census Bureau data on monthly retail sales with the dark green line being, or sorry, the, the light green line being non-store retailers, which is traditionally online retailers. And then the dark green line on the bottom being total retail. Um, so everything excluding the online only retail. In the midst of the pandemic, that traditional retail category crater dropping 22% through April um, as a year over year number before climbing back. And whereas uh, the most recent data of July, seeing that we're just roughly in line, slightly above 2019 levels, 3% above. In contrast, the e-commerce space, the, the non-store retailers and the online only retailers has been growing markedly for the past decade. And you can see even in January and February, a 10% growth year over year, but the pandemic accelerated that. Moving into April, May, June, July, the year-over-year -year growth has been consistently between 25% and 30% um, for online retailers. And in the midst of this context, the impact for traditional retailers has been that those that embrace omni-channel access to their consumers have been the most successful. And brick-and-mortar retailers, the doubling or tripling 
of their online sales volume since the pandemic. Shown here are year-over-year -year online sales growth for several um, large retailers. Um, and some, like Best Buy, as I said, um, saw a 242% growth in their online sales and then Target and Dick's Sporting Goods seeing a tripling of their online sales growth. All of this is an indicator that moving forward, success for the retail industry clearly looks like an embracing an omni-channel approach. Leaning into online sales in addition to brick and mortar sales as a way to reach consumers where they are at and access them at every step of the process. We've also seen a dynamic convergence of retail with other asset classes in the midst of the pandemic, an acceleration of a trend that was present even um, pre-COVID-19. One of these, for example, is the convergence of retail and industrial, and in, in particular, this interesting dynamic of retail to industrial conversions. TBRE is tracking 60 projects across the United States that are a con uh, actual conversion of former retail space into industrial distribution or fulfillment facilities. There are several here in Southern California, including this case study highlighted here, which was a retail space in Orange County, 100,000 square feet, that the retailer decided was had a higher benefit as a fulfillment center than actually as a direct consumer retail store. And the store, as a result, has been adapted and shifted into a different use. Beyond retail to industrial, we see interesting and exciting synergies between retail and other asset classes, retail and industrial conversions and integrations, retail to multifamily conversions and integrations are all present in the marketplace and suggest a dynamic future for retail moving out of the pandemic. And lastly, let's talk about the changes in the way that we live. As I talked a little bit about at the beginning, COVID-19 has changed the way we interact with residential real estate. People are spending more time at home. Um, in, the, in the worst uh, period of the quarantine and social distancing, people were spending 30% more time at home than they were prior to the pandemic. And as a result, as you would expect, um, some have reconsidered their living arrangements. Research out of the Pew Center, which is shown here on the slides, indicates that 3% of Americans have chosen to move as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, that for reasons of COVID-19 have, have ad adjusted their, their um, living environment. That's not a massive number, right, 3%, but it is significant. In LA County, that represents about 100,000 households that are choosing to move as a result of the pandemic. More instructive, though, is why they moved and where they moved. Among those who moved because of the coronavirus pandemic, the three largest reasons for why that move occurs were one, to avoid the risk of getting the, getting the virus, two, to be closer to family, or three, to because their college environment was closed, that their college campus was closing. And the where they move to mirrors that, mirrors those sentiments in many ways. And the, that data is shown on the right side of, of this slide. 81% moved to either a family or friend's place or to a second home or a vacation home. In many ways, a temporary move to a place that they probably already had access to pre-pandemic. 15% though, move to a different independent living environment. You can see here that 90% bought or rented a new home um, to, with the intent of living after the period and 7% bought a new home with the idea being that it was a temporary solution for the duration of the pandemic. And all of this is to suggest that the shift in demand, while significant and substantial, is overwhelmingly a temporary one, that there's a real shift in, in the demand dynamics for residential space across the US, but it's likely to be one that persists for the duration of the pandemic. And we're already seeing that play out in the real estate fundamentals and the fundamentals of the multifamily market. Shown here are asking rates for greater Los Angeles and the change since January. Asking rates in the urban core, which roughly describes um, Los An downtown LA to the west side, to Santa Monica, declined by 4% in the last nine months. Meanwhile, outside of the urban core, more suburban areas or periphery areas remained roughly constant, roughly steady, um, decreasing a little bit in March, April, but hovering right around um, January levels. Of course, some outlying suburban areas have seen demand increase, and Santa Clarita Valley is a great example where rents since January have climbed by a pretty striking 4%, 4.5% uh, in that period. Zooming out and thinking back over the last six months, the human toll and certainly the economic toll both have been and continue to be, of the virus have been and continue to be quite substantial. We're seeing very real dislocations in the um, commercial real estate world and the commercial real estate market in terms of how we work, how we shop, and how we live. And across all of these categories, though, 
the virus does not herald. I think the data clearly shows that the virus does not herald the end of the category. Instead, it suggests a period of really dynamic shifts going forward over the next several months, the next several years, and how we relate to the physical environment of how we work, how we live, and how we shop. And that's it. Thank you, Eric, for a really interesting presentation of your data and certainly describing these dynamic times. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, I'm encouraged to hear what you said about the non-demise of the office. And I've heard it speculated that some people think we're going to see more office uh, consumption because the social distancing and space demands. And I'm wondering what you think about that theory. Yeah, that, that is something we've been hearing a lot about. And I think in conversations with clients and large corporate real estate users, there's been a mix of short-term, medium-term, and long-term conversations, right? Short-term being about how do we adapt the office space to be safe in the near term before the virus is um, successfully mitigated or a vaccine is present. The medium term is to the extent that any of this continues and, and we think that we're preparing for a future in which there are consistent pandemics, how do we adapt the office place? And then of course the long term is a lot of what I described about the long term viability of multiple modalities of office space. And I think that the jury is still out on the degree to which social distancing shows up in office floor plates. Um, we certainly in the near term, that's an important element of getting people back in the office, but it's unclear that, that corporations are going to embrace that and see a long-term future where there will be a consistent need to have social distancing in order to maintain a safe working environment. When you hear from your companies that they want that flexible modality, and do you think that looks like individual co-working spaces for a given company or does that look like the service providers like a we work or some of the others that you mentioned which do you do, do they want their own or do they want to be part of larger groups yes well we've seen an exciting convergence of these two things right and so in for traditional corporate um, real estate that is leased and managed and owned perhaps by the corporation, there has been a shift in the physical environment to more resemble the structure of a WeWork or a HANA or, or any of those um, sorts of products. So there, that is happening on the one hand, but it's more of a software solution, so to speak, of kind of shifting the way it looks um, rather than, than a real structuring solution. But we're also seeing a, an adoption on a very large scale of flexible space um, by corporations using third party providers. Um, using third-party providers because it gives them a level of flexibility and scalability with their needs. It's not the whole port part of their corporate real estate portfolio for most of these users, but it's increasingly becoming a critical element that allows them to scale rapidly growing initiatives or to um, perhaps access talent in markets where they're not willing to opus, open a major, a major office. So there is, um, we're seeing both of those elements come to play. Have you seen companies ready to move forward on making decisions on this. Your chart showed that the actual you know, completion of deals in suburbs, et cetera, hasn't really come forth yet. Do you think that some, maybe that has something to do with them holding off on making those ultimate decisions? Yeah, there, across the industry, there has been a pullback as people, uh, as investors and, and occupiers look and take stock of the, the coronavirus and of the, the economic impact of the virus. And so certainly there has been a sense of pulling in the reins a bit. All of that is occurring at the same time, though, that major landmark users in New York and San Francisco and, and other and in Los Angeles and markets across the United States are saying, we're making a bet on office. We know that this is critical to the future of our company and critical to the future of attracting talent. And we're going to move forward with the office space that we think we need. So we do see companies putting putting their convictions on the line and saying, this is an important element of our, you know, of our strategy going forward and we need access to these communities. Um, this is interesting question. You use the case study of a retail environment converting into fulfillment. Do you see those those two uses blending? And maybe there's a fulfillment center that actually has a physical retail outlet? 
We do, and, and, and we see it in different ways. And, and maybe combining true retail with true warehouse distribution is going to be a, a tough marriage to make, but already many retailers are fulfilling e-commerce orders through their physical plant. Um, whether it's department stores that are fulfilling e-commerce through the department store at a given mall and then mailing out from there, or um, smaller mom and pop shops that are doing the fulfillment through their, their retail outlet. We see all of that occurring across the industry as the industrial and the retail worlds blend together um, as just different channels with which to access the consumer. That's great. Well, thank you, Eric, for the time today and sharing the research that CBRE has been doing. We look forward to learning more over time. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Eric's insight about real estate is particularly timely for the Santa Clarita Valley because the Santa Clarita Valley is in a period of significant growth. There is significant new development underway in all real estate sectors. We will continue to watch all the trends, but please let me share a bit about the tremendous business opportunities created by SCV's growth. The Santa Clarita Valley is within easy reach of LA, just 30 miles north of downtown Los Angeles. The fastest growing community in LA County, SCV is home to nearly 300,000 people. This award-winning region is known for its talented workforce, thriving technology sector, top-ranked schools, business-friendly culture, and unrivaled quality of life. Home to the largest collection of master-planned growing business parks and residential developments in LA County, the Santa Clarita Valley is Southern California's most desirable community. Let's take a quick look at what's ahead. The center at Needham Ranch is unmatched in access, building design, and cost effectiveness. This modern business park is just one mile from the city of Los Angeles and minutes from the 405 I-5 intersection. Ideal for logistics, entertainment, and manufacturing, the center at Needham Ranch offers easy access to downtown, West LA, LAX, and the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Vista Canyon combines high value homes, creative office space, and exciting retail opportunities. It's a truly innovative work of architecture and urban planning. Walkable, transit-oriented, and environmentally sensitive. Residential, office, retail, and recreation areas seamlessly mesh to create a sense of small-town community that reinvents the suburban experience for all who live and work here. IAC Commerce Center is a 1.3 million square foot brand new industrial development situated on 116 acres. Its state-of-the-art buildings provide easy access to I-5, making it a great location for logistics, distribution, and manufacturing operations. Set on nearly 160 acres, the Southern California Innovation Park is a beautiful, secure business campus with up to 900,000 square feet of additional development opportunities. SKIP offers functional work environments and provides employee amenities such as a new fitness center, Montessori school, sports courts, and walking trails to enjoy the campus's natural beauty. Featuring more than 21,000 new homes, Five Point Valencia will set a new standard of sustainability by protecting vast areas of open space and reducing or mitigating net greenhouse gas emissions to zero. Five Point Valencia will also create 11.5 million square feet of job generating uses at build out and thousands of permanent jobs, furthering SCV's economic vitality and expanding access to a vibrant live work community. The first homes are currently under construction. New development will fuel business and population growth in the Santa Clarita Valley for years to come, creating opportunities that can't be matched. To learn more about new development in the Santa Clarita Valley, visit scvedc.org. Many new companies are taking advantage of the opportunities and growth described in the video. SCV EDC is pleased to welcome these companies to the Santa Clarita Valley. Recently, we've had several new companies expand to the SCV that are ground up operations where they need to hire their entire workforce. I want to briefly mention two important advantages that these companies in the Santa Clarita Valley get to enjoy. First, SCV EDC has launched a new locally focused job board called LiveWorkSCV.com. This is a free resource for SCV companies who can post jobs for free. SCV residents who don't ever want to go back to the long commutes of the past can visit the site to find high quality local jobs. 
Our research shows that employees who work locally are more satisfied in their jobs and remain in those jobs longer. Second, SCV EDC partners with College of the Canyons as one of the key institutional resources in the region. COC provides workforce training on a wide range of subjects, from general job skills such as team building and communication to technical skills such as welding and CNC machining. COC has more experience providing these types of programs than any other community college in the state, and I believe that their quality is unmatched. So as these companies hire new employees, they can also tap into COC's training capacity, which is increasingly available online. I mentioned earlier that the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us just how interconnected our world is. Never before have we realized the intricacies of our global supply chains. It is therefore my great pleasure to introduce you to Peter Zihan, a geopolitical strategist, which is his fancy way of saying he helps people understand how the world works. Peter combines an expert understanding of demography, economics, energy, politics, technology, and security to help clients best prepare for an uncertain future. Over the course of his career, Peter has worked for the U.S. State Department in Australia, the D.C. think tank community, and helped develop analytical models for Stratfor, one of the world's premier private intelligence companies. Peter founded his own firm, Zihan on Geopolitics, in 2012 in order to provide a select group of clients with direct, custom analytical products. Today, those clients represent a vast array of sectors, including energy majors, financial institutions, business associations, agricultural interests, universities, and the U.S. military. He is a critically acclaimed author, and he has a keen eye that he looks towards what will drive tomorrow's headlines. His irreverent approach transforms topics that are normally dense and heavy into accessible, relevant takeaways for audiences of all types. Peter's third book, Disunited Nations, was published earlier this year. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to be here, although Peter is in Colorado. I think the best way to start out is to give you a quick 30-second view of why things are the way they are. Uh, at the end of World War II, Americans were convinced that they were about to be in a showdown with none other than Joseph Stalin. And we decided that we needed an array of allies, not to stand with us or stand behind us, but to stand in front of us, between us and the Soviets. As a result, we crafted what we now think of as the global order of globalization, where the United States will use its Navy to patrol the global oceans for anyone so that everyone can ship anything from anywhere to anywhere else without having to worry about piracy or privateering. And that ultimately gave us this map. Now, the light blue, those are the countries that we cared about here in the United States before World War II. And the green were the new allies in this new global order, the first global order. But everyone else was on the outside. In fact, most of those red countries were on the other side. And so what we did bit by bit from 1946 until the fall of the Berlin Wall is we invited other countries to join. And those are the yellows, and you'll notice that involves the Chinese. Now, the countries that benefited the most from this new structure were those that were either too resource poor to be able to challenge the major naval powers, countries like Germany, or those who had weak geographies that made them prey to those empires, places like China. And so with the global order for the first time in their existent, existence, China and countries like them could access resources and markets without needing to secure them militarily. And that changed everything. That gave us the world that we know. But that world is over. Remember, this was a security program. It ended at the end of the Cold War in 1989. And since then, the Americans have been steadily reducing their troops ever since. We had a hiccup when it came to 9-11 and the following wars in the Middle East. But for the most part, the Americans have come home. Our troop deployments globally are now at the lowest level since the 1920s. And everything that's left of the system, everything that's left of the world that we think that we know, is simply running on inertia. And perhaps the worst part for the non-Americans in the world is that the U.S. really doesn't care. And it has to do with who might be able to pick up the mantle. Now, what we have here are two carriers. The one on the left is a supercarrier. The one on the right is a traditional jump carrier. 
on the deep blue sea without support from land-based aircraft. It takes seven jump carriers to fight off a single supercarrier. Now there are 11 jump carriers, excuse me, there are 21 jump carriers in the world, 11 of which are American. There are 11 supercarriers in the world. Every single one of them is American, which means that if you sailed the entire Navy of the rest of the world against the United States, it would only take one, maybe two aircraft carrier battle groups to carry the day for the Americans. There is no country that this century can hope to displace the Americans on the waves. And the United States is the only country that can make the system work. But it's also the only country that doesn't need it to work. The United States designed the global system to fight a war. It did not do so as an economic investment. And Americans have collectively decided that our security issues are local and regional, not global. So we're out, which means that the global system has lost its designer, its broker, its investor, and its protector. And that, all of that, is just the first factor. Geopolitically speaking, the world that we know is artificial. It's ending. And it's bending back towards something that, historically speaking, is a lot more normal. That means less interaction. That means less trade. That means financial shortages. That means less integration. That means less growth. And remember, that's, that's just the first point. Second, you have to look at demographics. Now, this is the demographic of Mexico. What we've got here are children on the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, men on one side, women on the other. Mortality tends to build it into a pyramid. <clears throat> now, when American business leaders and politicians look at something like the Mexican demography, we kind of like what we see. Because all those young people are relatively low down on the value-added skill, value-added scale. They're relatively new to their jobs. They don't add a lot of value to their products. That's not what Americans are good at. We're very highly educated. We're very highly motivated. We are very high value-added workers. And so the propensity to trade between low-end Mexican manufacturing and assembly and high-end American manufacturing and design is huge. It's an excellent relationship. It's the most robust trade relationship in the world. Second, Mexicans are young. And when you're below roughly age 40, it's all about the spending, buying houses, buying cars, raising kids, spend, 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 which means that Mexicans absorb a lot of American imports. This is a beautiful relationship, honestly, from an economic point of view, not that there aren't complications, but again, this is what we look for in a trading partner. And this is not. The Koreans had a baby bust back in the 1980s. They never recovered which means they've got a lot of people aged 40 to 60, which means these people have already sent their kids on. They're off at college or beyond. They're not buying a lot anymore. And because they've been in their jobs for 20, 30, 40 years, they're very high value added. They're going head to head with the American workforce. So a trade relationship with a country like South Korea is very problematic. Now for the last 25 years, 40 years, from 1980 to roughly 2015, the world demographically was in a beautiful moment. All of the world's economies were either consumption-led like Mexico's or export-led like South Korea. And so there was a good balance of trade, a lot of economic activity, a lot of things flying back and forth across the oceans. What we have here are the demographic pictures of some of the major economies in the year 2000. It was a perfect balance, excellent for globalization. But 20 years later, we're all 20 years older. And that balance is gone. A lot of those consumption-led economies have aged into being export-led. And a lot of those export-led economies are aging into post-growth. We are no longer in a system where everything's in balance. The global demographic of high consumption was already ending. And courtesy of COVID, it's likely already over. As to the export-led economies, they're aging into mass retirement, they're post-growth. The year 2022 is the year that most of the advanced world shifts from being export-led to post-growth. And COVID has robbed us of the time we had left to prepare for that transition. Now, the United States isn't cleanly in one of those two categories. Its demographics have slimmed, but it hasn't inverted. 
Now, our baby boomers are still aging into mass retirement, and just coincidentally, that still happens in the year 2022 along with the rest of the advanced world. But America has something going for it that the rest of the advanced world doesn't. Millennials. We might think of them as annoying, and we might not like their bedazzled flip-flops or all those goddamn scooters, but they exist, and they're having children, and they're buying homes. And from a consumption point of view, that makes them the single largest market on this planet. And they will remain the single largest market on this planet for at least another 15 years. I hate to say it, but the millennials may just save us all. Because I need to give you an idea of just how sharp this is going to be. Let me give you an idea of scale. Now, in 2020, the United States is the only large consumption-led economy that's going to remain a large consumption-led economy in 2030. What I've done here is I've stacked up all of the world's 100 largest economies, which make up 95% of global economic activity. And in the first column, you can see where everybody is now. And in the second column, you can see where everybody will be in 10 years. Now, there's a thousand ways we could do this and quibble with some of the specifics. So this is just using the data we have available today. But if you look at where the export-led economies are, they age into obsolescence. That entire category goes away. Now, right now, Japan, the world's largest and fastest aging demography, I'm sorry, the world's largest collection of old folks and the fastest aging demography, it's really the only post-growth economy we have. But by the time we get to 2030, not only will the Chinese and the Europeans have joined them, but we will, as a planet, have aged past the point where the economic structure of today is even theoretically possible. And this was all before COVID, before COVID took away a year or two of consumption and a year or two of production and more than a year or two of financial capacity. We will never return to where we were in 2019. That model's gone. Betting on globalization now is like betting on buggy whips when the Model T started falling off, rolling off the line. That era is over. Going to something different or perhaps something a lot older. You remove the Americans from the equation. You, you let the chips work, fall where they may. You'll get serious conflicts in places that the Americans used to hold together. These are the places where I expect them to be most explosive. Now, for those of you who know your world history, you'll recognize that these are the places that have seen the greatest wars in the history of our species. And for those of you who know economic history, you will recognize these zones as the areas that have seen the greatest economic growth since 1945. There's no coincidence. That's because of the order. The Americans forced everyone to be on the same side and outlawed war among the various order members so that we were all on the same side against the Soviets. But with the Americans gone, history reasserts. And these zones are responsible for three quarters of global energy shipments, agricultural shipments, and manufacturing supply chain steps. This is the end of the world that we know. Now, the gentleman who's kind of midwifing this process is this guy. This is Robert Lighthizer. He's the US trade representative. He's responsible for enforcing and negotiating every trade deal we have. Now, this is not his first stint in government. He also worked for Team Reagan back during the 1980s. Now, if you dial back to the 1980s, the Cold War was running hot and heavy. We actually had a nuclear scare over Berlin in 1983. And a lot of the Allies were doing things that the Reagan administration was not overly fond of. Specifically, the Germans, the French, the Japanese, they were all intervening egregiously in currency markets to push down the value of their currencies versus the US dollar so they could export more to the American market. Kind of violated the spirit of the order, but Reagan really needed everyone lined up shoulder to shoulder with us against the Soviets, so he was willing to look the other way. But fast forward to 1985. Gorbachev had risen to power. The Cold War was winding down. The Reykjavik summit was a wild success. So Team Reagan pulled the allies together at the Plaza Hotel in New York and said, look, we see what you've been doing. You're going to stop. You're going to stop today. Because if you do not, the United States will re remove itself from the global order and you can deal with the Soviets yourself. The intimidation worked. 
Within six months, allies not only stopped the intervention, they reversed it. And within six months, the US dollar had dropped by half. Now, Robert Lighthizer here, he was the Reagan administration's hatchet man assigned to Tokyo to make sure that he did not renege on the deal. And whenever he got his marching orders, he'd walk into the Ministry of Finance, lay out the American position. And then when it was time for the Japanese to issue the rebuttal, he'd take off his translator microphone and disassemble it on the desk and have a little GI Joe war with pieces. When the Japanese were finished, he'd scoop it back together, put it up, put it back on, and say, well, that, that, was, that was riveting. But we're going to do it my way, right? When he accepts a job, he makes sure he has all of the cards. He makes sure he has political cover, and then he doesn't negotiate. He forces his solution on whoever's on the other side of the table. This is the guy who's been char in charge of every trade talk the United States has engaged in for the last three and a half years. And he's generated results. These are the five deals that matter to the United States. Korea, Japan, Canada, Mexico, and the United Kingdom. And these are countries that honestly don't have a lot of choice. South Korea doesn't exist without American security overwatch. They had to capitulate on every point of the program. Canada has no other options and it can't pivot to another trading partner. The United Kingdom destroyed its links to the European Union. So it's a deal on Washington's terms or an economic depression. We'll see that one, that deal happen later this year. And it has been seared into the collective memory of Japan just what happens when the United States turns hostile. Of these five, only Mexico has any wiggle room because Mexico has things that the United States wants. A young demographic, a growing market, and a complementary economic system. So with the exception of the deal with the United Kingdom, which will happen later this year, Deals with these countries aren't simply sewn up. They've already been implemented. It's done. And that just leaves China. Now, I could give you 30, 40 reasons why China will not be in existence as a unified nation state a decade from now. But really, this is the single most important. It's the islands that roughly parallel the Chinese coast. Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore. It's not just that they're all allies, although they are. It's that they form something that the Chinese call the first island chain. And the Chinese have never in any period of their 3,500 year long history ever been able to penetrate that chain in a commercial manner and integrate economically with the world beyond. There is one exception today under the order because the Americans have forced everyone to be on the same side. But if you remove the Americans from the equation, this region goes back being more antagonistic. And China simply lacks, China has lacked its entire history, the military capacity to enforce any sort of globe-spanning trade system. In fact, any sort of East Asian-centric trade system. All the Americans have to do, if the goal really is to destroy China, is go home. Now, I said there are 30 to 40 reasons. I'm gonna give you a couple more. Let's look at demographics. Now, this is the Chinese demographic in 1980. You'll notice it's very young. And when China joined the order after Nixon went to China, they were able to produce goods at a price that no one could compete with because they had so many young people, supply and demand. But if you fast forward 20 years, it looks a little bit different. Between 1980 and 2015, China experienced the perfect demographic moment. And there were three pieces to it. First, they had lots of young people, so low production costs. Well, that was over 20 years ago. And Chinese labor costs since 2000 have increased by more than a factor of 10. Second, Chinese young adults had few kids with higher spending in the short run. That's the Chinese boom that we've seen these last 10 years, but that's nearly over. There's a consumption trough coming. And third, China cannibalized the countryside to fuel urban activity, and that's over. The countryside is now nearly empty of people of reproductive age. In many ways, the Chinese development story is a bit like what happened here in the United States with the move from the farm to the city. But whereas in the United States, it happened over two centuries. In China, it happened in just one generation. So here's the Chinese demography today. They are enjoying one last burst of consumption 
before that one block of population ages into not being significant consumers in the future. They've not only aged out of their beautiful demographic moment, the Chinese have aged past the point of demographic recovery. And it shows up in their labor data. These are several Southeast Asian countries that I think will actually do pretty well in the world we're moving into. This is Mexico, a country with very competitive. And here's the labor cost in the People's Republic of China. They have simply moved past the point where they can participate in a meaningful trade system. In fact, if you look at the consumption numbers, it's really bad. Here is domestic car sales month by month from a year earlier. Now that big drop off in January of 2000, that's from the coronavirus pandemic. That is what you would expect when people don't go outside, they don't buy cars. That's not what I talk about, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, the trouble that China is in. I'm looking at the two years previous. Look at how negative that is. Now this is pre-COVID, this is in 2019, this is in 2018. This is when the big story was how China was going to take over everyone and rule the world and be a big consumption led economy. It's just that it's not true. Even within their own system, even with their own data, China has already gone terminal. They also have a shorter term problem, trade talks. Look who's there. Lighthizers has been in charge of all the trade talks everywhere in the world, wherever they happen to be. Now, this is the guy who wrote the World Trade Organization Charter. This is arguably the most free trade person in the American political establishment today. And if you look at what might happen after November, whether it's Trump or Biden, the Chinese cannot count on anything get, getting easier because either Trump will win, in which case Lighthizer only has one country to focus on, or Biden will win. And Biden has personally called President Xi Jinping a thug and has advocated a series of anti-Chinese trade policies that are far more strict than what we're facing today. 2019 was as good as it was gonna get. To put this more short term, this gentleman, Ambassador Branstead from Iowa, used to be the governor. He is arguably the person in the United States most capable of generating a positive working relationship with the Chinese because he's on a first name basis with President Xi Jinping of China. He, Branstead and Xi have been friends since they first met in 1985. And so when Trump appointed Branstead to be ambassador, everybody assumed that things were gonna go swimmingly. Well, after months of relations deteriorating, Branstead last week wrote an op-ed about how the relationship was falling apart and what the Chinese had done to push it in that direction. The Chinese, of course, immediately censored the document and Branstead resigned this Monday morning. Whoever replaces him is gonna be a China hawk, not a China dove. Okay, let's talk about some of the economic sectors so you have an idea of what's coming down the pipe in that front. Now, this is what we call the total private credit curve. This is all credit private, all private credit from all sources to all sources, mortgages, credit cards, stocks, everything. The only thing that is not included is interbank lending. So if one bank is lending overnight window monies to another bank, that's not there, but everything else. Now, from the start of this chart in 2000 to the middle in 2008, that line going up, that is the subprime crisis in a single graphic. We doubled total private credit in the United States in two years, excuse me, in seven years. It was too much, it was too fast. As a result, we had a bubble, it burst, we had a recession. In the ensuing year and a half, 5% came off of headline GDP. Since then, private credit growth has rebounded and we're back to something much more similar to the century average. This is our baseline. Now, the same data, but this time in relative terms instead of absolute. So a little bump in the middle, again, that's a doubling. Here's the Eurozone. In the time the United States doubled total credit, the Europeans tripled it. As a result, the European financial crisis hit harder, lasted longer. Several countries, such as Italy, still haven't recovered to where they were in 2007. And because of COVID and demographics, they probably never will. Here's Greece, sevenfold increase of credit in seven years. And they're not done. 
before COVID came, they were looking at least another 20% contraction on top of the 40% they had already suffered. Because of COVID, they will never recover. Here's Brazil. This is what a lost decade looks like, assuming you get the politics right. I don't know how many of you follow Brazilian politics. Well, actually, you know, all of you should follow Brazilian politics. I mean, do you like Game of Thrones, um, Maury Povich, the, uh, the impeachment hearings, you know, drama, 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 drama. You've got to get into Brazilian politics. Holy crap. Uh, they, had a they, uh, they had a presidential election a couple of years ago. And the final two guys, one guy was campaigning from prison where he had been convicted of corruption because in Brazil, you can run for office from prison. You just can't, you know, be president. And then the guy who won at his last big public rally said that the real problem with those Nazis is that they're just too soft on their domestic opponents. Wow. So this honestly is probably two lost decades. And for a country like Brazil that is so dependent on imported capital, coronavirus means that they're probably not going to return to 2019 ever either. Here we have India in purple and Turkey in black, two countries that are still early in the process. Now, both of these countries have already elected to office on, for multiple terms, ethno-nationalist leaders who have no problem using state resources to spawn race riots on purpose in order to get a bump in the polls from their more reactionary supporters. I think Trump's bad, they have nothing on these two. Now, you'll notice that the Turkish line, the black one, actually dipped last year. Why? Well, that was the start of their financial correction. What also happened last year? The Turks invaded Syria and Iraq. It was a distraction play. And then here's the People's Republic of China. And let me bring that down for you. Yeah. China is now the most over-credited country in human history in both relative and absolute terms. It is Enron in nation state form. Every system that we know, every company that has ever followed this model of force-fed capital has eventually collapsed. It's just a question how bad it will be. And China's now pushed this further and harder than anyone else. So it's going to be historically unique. Now, the point of all of this is that there's a large series of major financial crises that aren't just inevitable. Some of them might actually be imminent. That's a lot of money that's going to be looking for a safer location. And what does foreign money want? Rule of law? hard fiscal assets, implicit government guarantees, dividends. If you're looking to tap global credit for local development, there will never be a better time than right now. All right, that's finance. Let's look at energy. What we've got here is price breakdown. So the broader the bar, the greater the volume of crude oil that comes out of the various country for export. The taller the bar, the greater the cost of producing the crude. Now, this is data from eight years ago, 2012. And back then, U.S. shale was the most expensive crude in the world to produce. And we only, only kicked out about 4 million barrels a day. That's about Iran at its peak. Now, for a country the size of the United States, that was useful, but it really didn't change the strategic math. That was then. Fast forward eight years, and we've had breakthroughs in water management, data management, drilling technology. And the U.S. is now one of the lowest cost producers in the world and... As of the first of the year, we were net oil exporters. Now, COVID is scrambling all the data, so we're going to have to take another look at this in a few months once things calm down. But the United States is here to stay as a major oil producer, as a net exporter, and it's not like these technologies are going to be uninvented. This is the new normal. The U.S. really doesn't need the rest of the world to keep the lights on. But California does. California is the only state in the lower 48 that is not participating in the shale revolution in some way. It is now, of the states, the single largest oil importer. Two-thirds two of the oil that California uses is imported. About half of that comes from the Persian Gulf, which means that California is now the most energy insecure state. And if there was any sort of shock that interrupted oil production globally, most of the United States would focus would reorganize on the shale sector, which would keep energy prices low and calm, whereas California would be the only state that would still be forced to go out into the international market to source an ever more volatile and ever smaller energy supply. 
there is an energy crisis in the United States, but it's only for California. Now, the other side of the shale revolution isn't with oil, it's with natural gas. Now, what we've got here is something I'll call the checkbook map because every dot is somewhere where someone can pay the power bill. The biggest, the most important concentration of checkbooks in human history is this dot right here. This is Marshalltown, Iowa. This is where I'm from. And this is not a rave. Western North Dakota, I don't think so. Now, what's going on here is a problem disconnect with transport. Now, oil is a liquid. You can put it into a bucket. You can put it into a rail car. You can put it into a barge. You can put it into almost any sort of container. And if you can't move it that day, you'll just put it into a holding tank. It's not going to move anywhere on you. But you can't do that with natural gas. It's a gas. It disperses. So you have to have a pressurized collection, transport, and usage system that's leak-free that can process the end product just as fast as it comes in because you almost can't store it anywhere. Now, here in the United States, we've got the world's largest and most versatile natural gas distribution system, but we can barely keep up with what's coming up out of the shale oil fields as a byproduct. So until we can build out the infrastructure, we have to flare it. And you can see those flares from space. Now, what that means is that the United States is now the world's largest supplier of natural gas. And that has driven the price of the stuff well below what you would expect market norms to be. What can't you do with an endless supply of it? We've retooled our entire industrial sector, especially in Petrocom, to use natural gas whenever possible. So we're not using as much oil. We're not even using as much electricity. And that's made the US, the, 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 that has made the United States the lowest cost supplier for all of the chemical inputs that are a basis for everyday life. And of course, the least creative but most important way right now that we're using all this extra natural gas is burning it for electricity. What we've got here is average power prices in the United States for all folks, uh, whether it's residential, industrial, or otherwise. And you'll see that about 10 years ago when the shale revolution began, power prices more or less flatlined. Uh, since then, we've seen no significant increase in power prices, and the U.S. now has the cheapest electricity in the world without even using subsidies. Uh, you can look at specific states to give an idea of how it's different around the country. This is New York, where it is illegal to produce natural gas in any appreciable volume, but they have no problem importing it from next door in Pennsylvania. Uh, and then here is Texas, where, of course, it's wildly legal to produce the stuff, and they have seen power prices drop by about 30% in the last decade, among the lowest in the country now. But here's California. California is the only state in the lower 48 that is not participating in the shale revolution in some way. They're not using the technologies to produce locally, and the pipelines that bring natural gas in from the rest of the country have been at max capacity for quite some time. So California now has the highest electricity prices in the lower 48. They're going up, and they're probably going to be going up for at least the next 25 to 30 years. After that, we'll have to see what happens with technology. But it does put California at a competitive disadvantage versus the rest of the country. And then there's the issue of transport. Now, back during the 1980s, the Iranians and the Iraqis were involved in a bitter war. And by the time we got to 1985, that war on land had reached a stalemate. So they started throwing missiles at each other's commercial shipping. In this tanker war, 300 vessels were hit, 50 were disabled, and a half, about a dozen were sunk. <coughs> that almost destroyed the global insurance industry because no one had ever made allotments for damage to commercial shipping, which is normally a low-risk venture, on that scale. And it changed the way we insure vessels. Today, if you want to insure your vessel, you have to pay for an annual premium about 2.5% the value of your vessel. That assumes you never sail into a conflict zone. Should you sail into a conflict zone, the price of that insurance increases by a factor of 100 to be paid out every week. That assumes no one shoots at any commercial shipping. Should someone be taking pot shots at commercial vessels, your policy evaporates. It's null and void. So the first time in this post-America world where shipping is targeted, you can guarantee that no one is going to be sailing anywhere near these conflict zones. That's three quarters of manufacturing supply chain steps, three quarters of global agricultural shipments, and three quarters of global energy supplies gone. Now, for most Americans, this is a minor issue. 
most of our trade is within the Western Hemisphere. In fact, half of our trade is just with Canada and Mexico. It doesn't have to sail in the deep blue sea. But that's not the case for California. California isn't just the state most dependent upon trade with East Asia. It's the trade gateway. It has lots of throughput, all of which sails the deep blue sea. You can get an idea of where some of these exposures specifically lie when you look at manufacturing chains. The 1555 in the middle of this graphic is total value-added manufacturing within the United States. And all the circles and arrows on the outside pointing in are where all the components come from. The 1555 in the middle of this graphic indicates the total of value-added manufacturing in the United States. That 1555, that's $1.555 trillion. All of the circles and arrows that flow in from the outside indicate the value in billions, and then the color indicates the likelihood it's going to be disrupted in this world that we're moving into. Green means it's probably fine. Yellow means figure 25% of it's not going to make it. Orange is half, and red means just don't count on it at all. It's not going to show up. Now, you'll notice for the United States that there's a lot of green, a fair amount of yellow, and no red. That doesn't mean that the United States is immune to what's coming, but it's something we can grow through. It's something we can manage. By the way, the state that's most exposed to all of this in absolute terms is Texas, but most of that exposure is via Mexico, so that's probably fine. It's not fine for the Germans. The Germans are much more dependent upon the countries that they border, and especially on countries beyond the horizon for their value add. In addition, because they have the world's second most rapidly aging demography, they are wildly dependent on countries beyond the horizon to purchase the end product. There's nothing about the German system that can work without American security overwatch. But that's nothing compared to what the Chinese are facing. The Chinese are completely dependent on high tech from other sources. Now, I'm sure that you have heard the Made in China 2025 program, the idea that China is seeking technological parity with the United States in just five years. If you talk to any Chinese bureaucrat but behind closed doors where their minder is not listening, it'll become pretty obvious to you that 2025 is really just the first step. They don't expect true parity until at least 2070. They don't have that kind of time. Now, some version of this holds true. Obviously, especially in manufacturing, the U.S. is very well positioned for the low end, the shale revolution and low transport costs to end consumers bodes very well for American low end manufacturers. And the U.S. is also well positioned on the high end. The U.S. has the capital, the tech and the labor force. And within manufacturing, there are two subsectors that are very heavily exposed to this. The first is automotive, but about two thirds of that is within NAFTA. That's manageable. The bigger concern is the second one, technology manufacturing. About two thirds of that is in East Asia. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. First, we have to have an idea of the decision-making process here. If this were just about energy and markets and transport and resources and finance, everybody would be handing to the United States, but it's not. It's also about coronavirus. No one knows precisely how long the pandemic will last or in what order it will end, and this graphic gives you an idea of why. You can see the United States, the blue line, has never really recovered from our first wave, and we're already starting to gear up for something worse. The European Union did recover from their first wave, but they're already back to their first wave highs and are actually seeing a number of states like Spain that are already suffering inf new infection rates that are worse than what we have here in the United States. The Middle East, and the Latin American countries are on the whole as bad or worse than what's going on here in the United States. So you've got to decide what matters. If you were already looking to escape from China in 2019, whether it's because of human rights or information security or the police state or what's going on in Hong Kong or the genocide in Zhejiang, you know, coronavirus only confirms your decision and you accelerate your own extraction. But if you were hanging on due to sunk costs, you're probably going to wait to be forced by circumstances or governments. And for the most part, that's the view of Silicon Valley. They have bet their entire existence on globalization. Nearly their entire manufacturing chain is in East Asia. And very little of that is going to last, which means that when they do move, when they are forced to move, it will all move 
at once. Potential recipient locations who are ready for that can inherit 50 years of supply chain expansion almost overnight. And potential recipient, recipient locations who cannot will get nothing. Why am I specifically mentioning Silicon Valley and computing manufacturing? Personally, I think semiconductor manufacturing would be a great fit for Santa Clarita. Now we've talked about energy and transport and finance already. Let's look at some of the peculiarities of your geography and give you an idea of what that means for your possibilities. Let's start with a population density map. As you can see, California's population centers are not simply isolated from Canada and Mexico. They're separated from the US writ large and even from other major West Coast population centers. You zoom in a little bit and you can see that the Los Angeles basin isn't simply separated from the West Coast, it's broken off from the rest of California itself. Zoom in a little bit more. The various lobes of the LA basin are largely on their own. And even within the various lobes, there really isn't much of a transport network. It's, it's pretty wretched. The population footprint is too dense to function without mass transit. And as you all know, there's really no mass transit within Los Angeles. I'm sure you've all sat in LA traffic for far more of your life than you would have liked to. So California is not participating in the shale revolution. So you should pencil in ever rising power prices and a sustained energy crisis. California is not part of the American, much less the North American transport network. So it cannot generate economies of scale. Los Angeles cannot even generate economies of scale within LA. This all urges California to use its ocean frontage to integrate with places over the horizon. But unfortunately, that pattern is collapsing. And of course, Santa Clarita itself is largely hived off from the rest of LA. That means that Santa Clarita cannot compete in anything that requires cheap or reliable transport. You also cannot compete in anything that's low margin because you can never achieve economies of scale. You must move up the value added chain as far and as quickly as possible. So let's look at what COVID and deglobalization are making available. Every industry has its own characteristics, but review what we know. Finance will become more difficult, but not in the US. Complex supply chains are going away, but the United States writ large does not need to worry about transport. The United States has the best skilled labor market in the world and skilled labor is mobile. Proximity to markets is key and the United States is the market that matters. And large industry relocations will require large greenfield footprints. With that in mind, I see six subsectors of manufacturing that are going to relocate to the United States in large scale. The first top left is automotive. The automotive industry is one of the most complex in the world. Everyone builds a little bit of everything. But what coronavirus plus the trade war have done is they've disrupted these complex supply chain systems. Combine that with shale lowering local costs, and a lot of this has already moved back and more will in the year to come. Second, electronics, the bottom left. Kind of like automotive, everyone produces a lot of everything, but there's nothing really secretive about it. There's no real technological breakthroughs that people are trying to predict. That means it's easier to relocate than automotive because you don't have to worry about intellectual property to the same degree. Third, heavy machinery, top one, top center. This is one of those that is gonna move very, very quickly. It's similar to automotive, but it's a lot more concentrated because not everybody needs a forklift. Now there's a clause in the new NAFTA agreement that mandates that 80% of components must come from within North America. Here in the United States, we've largely outsourced that entire sector to China since the year 2000. It's all coming roaring back now. Bottom center, it's another one that's moving very quickly, wiring. The shale revolution has pushed production costs because of energy through the floor. Once you have the ore, you have to smelt it into an ingot and then pull it into a wire. Those are very energy intensive states, which means the United States is now the low cost producer. Top right's a fun one that nobody really saw coming, textiles. The technology of automated yarn spinning and cloth weaving and cutting is now cheaper than doing it with human labor in places like India and Bangladesh. 
We're going to see that industry writ large move back to the West. None of these five are what I would consider perfect for Santa Clarita. You don't really have a competitive advantage in land, labor, or energy. But the last one, the bottom right, semiconductors, that just might be for you. Now, some parts of the computing supply chain can be relocated right now. Motherboards, flash drives, final computer assembly, putting together things that are made from microchips. That's all currently in Thailand and China, and all of those facilities are already looking for new locations more appropriate to the world that we are entering. For the steps that can't be automated where you still need human eyes and fingers, Mexico is a solid candidate. But for steps where it can be automated, the United States looks pretty good, and it might be something that Santa Clarita would want to look into. But I'm, for you, more interested in the earlier steps of the process, the manufacturing of the chips themselves. These four photos kind of give you the rough idea of how it works. In the bottom right, you start with silicon powder, and you melt it down and draw it into a crystal. You slice it into thin wafers. Those wafers in the top right are then doped and baked to form the pathways that electrons follow in the semiconductors. You then get the top left, a big old disk with dozens, if not hundreds, of these kind of pre-chip materials. And those are broken apart in the bottom left and installed into chip formats that can then be used in any sort of computer process. The fun part about this is that this is all done in independent countries, individual countries. But the really fun part is all of this, from the drawing of the crystals to the doping and baking of the chips to the breaking apart and the making of the microprocessors themselves, it's all done in the same facility. It's a clean room issue. It all has to be done under the same roof. Now, relocating a semiconductor fabrication facility isn't something to be done lightly or quickly. Those are multi-billion dollar facilities. But I encourage you to think big because these fab facilities are going to have to move. I'll give you an idea of the speed. All these ships in manufacturing are not simply a forecast. This break from China is already underway. This graphic shows how fast things have moved to this point. The slider indicates what has left or come to China or other locations in the last couple of years. The blue is for China specifically, and the further left the slider is, the greater the percentage of total inputs that are now coming from somewhere else. There are a few subcategories here to pay attention to. First, these three categories are one where US shale is likely to predominate and is driving the change. Second, it's a largely regulatory issue, places where Team Lighthizer has forced changes into the treaty, which preferences North American production. Third are areas where Team Lighthizer has basically thrown tariffs on China and encouraged companies to relocate anyway. And then finally, there's the issue of cost in China rising, primarily, although not exclusively, due to rising labor costs. Now, in the industry where the Chinese have managed to maintain market share, energy, chemicals, agriculture, these are primarily industries in which there's a degree of heavy industrial legacy plant. You don't want to move this stuff. It's like a major refinery, a major chemicals plant. And it takes time to build the new infrastructure. But the United States is the world's cheapest producer of natural gas, which is the primary input for most of these processes. So all of this is going to move, and it just takes a little bit of time for the United States to build out the industrial infrastructure. That is already happening. That was happening before coronavirus. That was happening before the trade war. So all of this is going to vanish in relatively short order. Second, the industries where China is losing market share most quickly, furniture, electronics, machinery, all of those are industries where incremental shifts are viable. If you have a car that has 3,000 parts, well, you know, you can make two or three in a different location. But the more parts you build in other locations, the more you've established an alternate production system elsewhere. It's an accelerating process. Most independent estimates project today that operational costs for manufacturing in North America in every manufacturing sector is now lower than pre-existing China-centric Asian manufacturing. 
Now, that doesn't mean you can just flip a switch. You still have to build the industrial plant in the United States. That is not free. But if you know that the end result of this is a better operating environment, the case is being made industry by industry that it's time to go. Just in calendar year 2019, we had a 20% reduction in the shipments from China to the United States for value-added manufacturing components. It is all moving. So let's cross some T's and dots some I's when it comes to semiconductors. The fab facilities are big. They require big investments and a lot of political capital. They don't move lightly, but they do move and they are starting to. These large fab facilities is what I think Santa Clarita should go after because it's about finance and labor as opposed to power prices. It plays to America's strengths and it plays to your strengths while ignoring most of the weaknesses that make other manufacturing efforts a reach for the area. You can tap the labor pool of Silicon Valley. You can tap the labor pool of greater Los Angeles without suffering from their transport weaknesses. And financing for something of this size will never be easier. Since coronavirus started, the US has already picked up its first new fab facility. It went to Phoenix. But there's another reason that I think you should target tech and tech manufacturing. Silicon Valley is about to get its butt handed to it. The Valley has placed all of its eggs in the globalization basket. Its entire manufacturing system is Asia centric and it will lose its entire China footprint. These facilities must move. But better for you, Silicon Valley has lost its political cover here in the United States across the political spectrum. Now the center left originally loved Silicon Valley because they were corporate titans with social agendas, remaking corporate America from within, or at least that's how the love affair started. But as information transmission became free, anything that impinged upon that transmission, upon that information flow, like say fact checking, Silicon Valley resisted to the end. The Valley continued to disavow responsibility even when ISIS was beheading Americans on their IT platforms, even when posts were blaming California's wildfires on Antifa. The center left hasn't simply dropped its support for Silicon Valley. It now sees the Valley as a threat to democracy itself. Very top of the list of people who matter, California's own senator, Dianne Feinstein. What about the center right? The center right used to laud the Valley as an example of what Americans could achieve in a low regulation, low regulation environment with a new technology. But then Silicon Valley CEOs let their personal political views not simply shape corporate policy, but much of the Valley committed to never working for the government for anything. Most notably though, for the intelligence community and the defense department. But their services were still fully available for sale. So their work could benefit the militaries and civilian monitoring programs of Russia and China. In particular, the same companies that refused to work with the US government helped build the nuts and bolts of the monitoring system that allowed China's genocide in Zhejiang. So the center right now doesn't merely question the Valley's ideology or even their patriotism, but their sanity. What's left of the American pro-business party is now anti-Silicon Valley. Now, as much credence as there is to the points of the center left and the center right, and I broadly agree with both, the concerns of America's political extremists are actually even more valid. Simply put, for the radical right, it's Main Street versus Wall Street. The populist right thinks of Silicon Valley as the greatest job destroying machine in American history, and they are actually correct but so's the radical left. Algorithms and robots don't pay taxes, but their output accrues to the operators and designers. The populist left moves Silicon Valley as the top reason for America's wealth inequality, and they are right. The solution for all four functions, all four factions, is to revoke the Valley's unlimited license and enact some sort of constraining, some sort of constraining regulation. Everyone wants to break Silicon Valley's power. Everyone wants to repatriate tech manufacturing. 
And Silicon Valley doesn't have the cost structure or the physical room or the labor force to bring the manufacturing base to the Valley in specific or even the Bay Area in general. It has to go somewhere else. Enter Santa Clarita. It's going to happen fast when it happens. But I do want to end with one final point because it might happen even faster than any of us has ever dreamed or feared. And that has to do with American culture. This is how most Americans think of themselves. Uh, the pioneer era. This is our national myth. The idea that you could go out, you could start new, and with six months after starting a new plow, you could be exporting grain down the greater Mississippi to sell to Europe for a high amount of cash. Uh, the can-do attitude. This is the source of it. But it does have a dark side. Because for 150 years, Americans saw their lives get better every single day. That's not normal. It was normal for us, but it's not normal. Sometimes the world punches you in the face. Sometimes you don't expect the change. And while other countries will take that in stride, where other countries, cultures can adapt to such rapid shifts, we in the United States aren't very good at that. Uh, we think that the covenant with God has been broken. We think that the sky is going to fall. And when the world does touch us on its terms instead of ours, uh, we panic. Now, if you're looking for someone to blame for this, I blame, oops, wrong way, I blame Canada because they were the first ones to do to us. Back in the War of 1812, uh, they burned down our capital. Kind of a dick move, not something a good neighbor does. And as a result, we started on this pattern of reaction and overreaction. We've done it about eight times in our history, every couple of generations. A few quick examples. 9-11 is probably the best one that's uh, on everybody's mind right now. 3,000 dead, terrorist attack that came out of nowhere. As a side effect of our reaction 9-11, we now have the sharp end of American power stationed on either side of every major trade and energy artery on the planet. My personal favorite is Sputnik, the beeping aluminum grapefruit. We were the head of the Russians in electronics, metallurgy, rocketry. But we wanted to make sure that whatever we threw up there was going to last. The Soviets didn't care. They just wanted to beat us to that one line. So the Sputnik went up, and 90 days later, it fell out of orbit. About the time it fell out of orbit, we launched our first satellite, Vanguard 1. It's still up there. We, however, retooled in a panic our entire industrial and educational base as a result of Sputnik. We coasted on that for 40 years. Well, folks, 9-11 was 19 years ago this month. We are going through some of the greatest changes human history has ever seen right now. To think that we're gonna make it through the next few years without some sort of weird shock, I think is naive. And what's different this time is that the United States really doesn't care what the world looks like the next day. And if you think demographic shifts, the collapse of the order, and COVID are forcing rapid changes, that's nothing compared to what would happen if the United States actually went out there and knocked over the anthill. All right, that's a lot for an hour. If you're looking for a little bit more of some suggestions, accidental superpowers, how it all started, why Americans care about what they care about and what they're going to care about in the years to come. Absent picks up where accidental left off, launches off with the shale revolution and plays into the military conflicts that will erupt around the world in America's absence. And then finally, Disunited Nations came out earlier this year, and it talks about why the countries that we think are the countries of the future aren't, and who actually will be headlining in the decades to come. Wow, Peter, absolutely amazing, and so much content, as always. So thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to go into a little bit of Q&A, uh, and not quite sure where to where to start, but let me uh, let me cover maybe give you a couple of broad topics and let you react to that. So you talked about opportunities for Santa Clarita issues in California, and we've talked about COVID. What do you think about onshoring and what happens in the field of biotech and onshoring related to pharmaceuticals and other technology and opportunities in that, that area. Let me kind of break that down into two topics because there's two very different angles. Uh, the first is the relatively low end, the drug manufacturing itself. 
uh, products that for the most part have been outsourced to the wider world over the course of the last 30 years, you know, prescription drugs, for example. Uh, about 95% of our normal prescription drugs are produced in other countries, most notably India and China. Uh, and one of the things that we have found out during coronavirus is, you know, maybe this is something we're not too thrilled with in terms of arrangements. Now, what is going to happen over the next few months is we're going to have a vaccine for coronavirus and we're going to have to manufacture it at volume. And every country that can manufacture it is undoubtedly going to try, <clears throat> excuse me, to keep as much of those, as many of those doses within their own national borders as possible. That is going to light a fire under the American people and under Congress to change the way that we do drug manufacture. And a lot of that is going to be forced to come back to the United States. Uh, that is honestly, whoever the first mover is on that in the United States is going to get most of it. Santa Clarita could go for that. I'm not sure you've got the massive competitive advantage there, but it is something to consider. The second piece, and I think something that you are probably better positioned for, is going for the higher end, the research and development of new drugs in the first place. Santa Clarita already has a reasonably large medical devices industry. Tijuana, which also has one, is not that far away. And partnership with universities and hospitals does not require immediate proximity. Uh, that is something where you already have some of the institutional and labor infrastructure in place that you can naturally expand into related sectors like drug development, especially things like biologics. So let's pick up on what you said there about the energy situation. You talked extensively about what's happening in California and the instability that we still import. What recommendations would you make? Uh, we've There's a lot of talk about going to everything being electrified here in California. You talked a little bit about gas and what, how it's produced. So what would be your advice uh, to control energy costs? And we have companies here that are some of the best uh, producers of oil and gas. Uh, how do we support them and how do we try to set us on the right course here? Well, I think we're past the point of advice. Uh, California has made a decision that is very expensive that is going to drive energy prices up for the long term. Uh, the goal of electrifying everything is, you know, interesting from my point of view as a developmental specialist, but uh, that means you need to not simply change your entire infrastructure for how you use power and how you distribute power, but you're going to have to expand your ability to generate electricity by at least a factor of four. Powering everything with electricity means you have to have more electricity. And uh, if you're gonna do that with solar and wind, you also then have to have a storage system for the entire state, which honestly uses more lithium than the world can produce in a decade. Uh, that's gonna drive prices up. That decision has been made. However, I don't mean to be a complete downer because the bureaucrats in Sacramento have been pretty good about being flexible with their standards. They do recognize that the technology to achieve some of these goals doesn't exist yet. And there is wiggle room, but it means that for Santa Clarita, you cannot count on anything but power prices going up for the foreseeable future. And that limits the sort of industries you can participate in. Now, personally, I don't think that's a death knell. It just means you have to go in value added wherever you can so that electricity prices, power prices, just like transport prices, are such a small component of the end product that it kind of gets washed out. Didn't see that coming, Peter. So thank you again for your time, uh, your thought provoking comments, and we look forward to hearing from you again soon. My pleasure. And now it is time to look forward and hear what our economist forecasts for the future of the Santa Clarita Valley. Dr. Schneep provided two updates in March and in June. He has now updated his forecast for the Santa Clarita Valley. Dr. Schneep's analysis is the only one that specifically evaluates the unique economic and growth dynamics of the Santa Clarita Valley. Dr. Mark Schneep is director of the California Economic Forecast, which he founded in 1989. He got his PhD from UC Santa Barbara with a focus in econometrics and regional e economics. He's an in-depth understanding of the Santa Clarita Valley and how it fits into the greater Los Angeles and California economies. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Mark Schneep. Okay, thanks Holly. Glad to be here. So today I want to uh, update the previous presentations that I've given 
um, and actually emphasize or focus on uh, the Santa Clarita Valley. Uh, but first, I want to uh, kind of give an overview of what's going on in uh, California. Um, and I want to start that by saying, uh, uh, or at least talking about, what we know now as opposed to what we knew back in April. So, currently, uh, we know now that the public health crisis that, of course, that we're in is leading most government decisions, uh, and those decisions subordinate economic issues. And we didn't know that that was going to be the case uh, back in April. The other thing we know is that this is especially true for California. Um, decisions have been confusing, they've been inconsistent, they've often seemed quite arbitrary. Okay, And the subordination of economic issues and the consequences from that um, have just lasted so much longer than anyone anticipated. We thought we'd be out of this by the summer months. Well, clearly that has not been the case. More of what we know the pandemic is not burning itself out like we thought it would. Um, and I think we've come to the realization now that in order to return to a normal state, the virus needs to be eradicated. Uh, it's just simply that's, that, that's got to be the case. Given the unrelenting, rightly or wrongly, emphasis on public health issue. Okay. So a therapeutic cure is going to be needed or a vaccine is going to be needed in order for restrictions, all the restrictions to be lifted. Uh, that's probably the only way that's going to occur. What we didn't know back in April is that by this time, we'd have nine vaccine candidates operating in phase three trials. So it's been quite impressive. Uh, and a vaccine could be ready as early as October, probably not, but certainly by the end of the year or early in 2021. That's kind of the timeline that is uh, motivating our forecasts right now. Let's talk about the labor market and the movements that we've seen. The labor market's coming back to life nationwide, um, and that's after the spring shutdowns. So the unemployment rate has now fallen to 8.4%. Um, but if you adjust for some of the misclassifications that the Bureau of Labor Statistics workers have been making, um, then uh, it may be as high as 9.1%. Okay, our uh, estimate of the effective unemployment rate, however, is as high as about 11% for the nation right now. And that's based on unemployment claims. California is not keeping up. The labor markets uh, are basically stagnant principally due to the reversals in the economy that were put in place during the summer months and have really endured until now. In March and April, we had 22 million workers that were laid off or furloughed nationwide. Uh, but since May, uh, we've recovered about nearly 11 million of them. They're working again. Okay. But we still have a deficit of about 11.6 million. So we still have a ways to go before we make those up. And in California, we have only recovered about 30% of jobs. Uh, the labor markets are stable. Uh, let, there's a lot fewer layoffs now. Uh, and employment claims are diminishing significantly. So uh, we're, we're seeing uh, things move in the right direction at the national level. But we need a stronger increase in hiring in order to reduce the extremely high rates of unemployment that we have right now. Some of the concerns about the labor markets, well, as I indicated, about half of all jobs have been recovered nationwide, only 30% in California. But the biggest concern is if there's going to be any more layoffs of workers. So that would be due to enforcement of existing restrictions uh, longer enforcement of them, and furthermore, perhaps even some new restrictions get put in place, and the lack of any new stimulus by Congress to help save households, which many of which are clearly struggling right now. In California, we were one of the last states to open up from the spring lockdowns 
uh, generally between mid-May and May 25th with the Bay Area opening up about a week later. Uh, and then everybody got excited uh, with the economy opening up. But then cases started increasing in the June and July time frame. And of course, that prompted the governor uh, ordering business closures again on June 28th and again on July 13th. Uh, so, And during the summer, it was decided to keep all schools closed this fall. Then they were allowed to open with the new blueprint uh, if you got a waiver. But so far, most public schools have never applied for that waiver, choosing to remain closed for most of the fall season. Okay, we still have the fifth highest unemployment rate in the nation among states. Uh, we have a disproportionately higher share of unemployment claims, nearly two and a half times our fair share. And what I mean by that is our fair share in terms of population, we have 12% of the population of the U.S., but we have 28% of the unemployment claims. Job creation in California has lagged most other states. We're still the most locked down state and the new color-coded blueprint that came out of the governor's office on August 31st for loosening restrictions or even tightening them again um, is, is reaffirming the fact that we continue to be the most locked down state. And you can go to a website the New York Times has and you can view and monitor how all 50 states are either opening or closing or reversing again to see uh, just where we are relative to other states and we're, we're again the most restrictive at this point in time. Retail stores, salons, barbershops are all open at 25% capacity. Uh, gyms, restaurants, bars closed unless they're outside. Uh, all entertainment venues are closed. Schools are closed to in-person instruction. Ditto colleges and universities. Uh, and so a lot of this just foregoes a lot of economic activity that we could be seeing in the state right now. We have all non-essential offices or office workers that have to uh, work remotely. That's in place right now. The unemployment rate that we monitor weekly and that we uh, evaluate weekly and compile weekly is currently at around 11% U.S. But for the... Uh, state of California, we come in, at least as of last week, at about 15.8%. So there has been this divergence that has occurred between the U.S. and California right now. And that's what's motivating the forecast going forward and certainly affecting also the Santa Clarita Valley or the local economy. So I want to now talk about Santa Clarita for the rest of the talk. During the uh, pandemic, uh, the, the impact that occurred in March, April, and May when we were shut down was a, a general net decline of about, well, closing in on 15,000 jobs in the Valley. Uh, but since then, the region has clawed back. About three to 4,000 jobs have been recovered. Uh, new development has been reinstated, so that's currently ongoing in the residential area and in commercial and industrial. Uh, we're not seeing a big calamitous effect on real estate utilization. Uh, and I'll talk about that very shortly. Uh, the pandemic has had a very uneven impact on the various sectors of the local economy. But then again, it has for the entire nation and state for that matter. The loss that we estimate for this year the annual average will come in at about 11,000 workers down. Uh, first negative year in quite some time. The distribution of where those losses are is here. No sector has really escaped job uh, consolidation. But finance and real estate uh, pretty much uh, has fared very, very well, has hardly seen any job decline. Same thing with healthcare, for that matter. Some of the larger sectors like manufacturing. Uh, there's a little bit more job loss, local government. Uh, but uh, again, the lion's share of the uh, impact has really occurred to the leisure and hospitality sector of which, of course, Magic Mountain is a participant there. So I'll talk about that in a minute. 
uh, when you look at uh, uh, the distribution of the type of uh, paying jobs uh, in which the pandemic has really impacted, it, it is the lower paying ones, uh, down about 7,000 jobs, whereas high paying jobs have declined uh, a little bit more than half of that, about 4,000. So that's the uneven distribution effects of the pandemic and how it's affected the Valley. Uh, Princess Cruises certainly uh, was impacted and they had they have announced layoffs of about a thousand workers uh, and I think that was in the June time frame. An employment rate for the Santa Clarita Valley is currently at around 14 or 15 percent. Uh, the annual average for the year will probably come in around 13. That's where we are. In the travel industry, let's look at hotel, motel vacancy rates or occupancy rates in this particular case, a sharp sudden uh, precipitous fall in March. We had hit a bottom in April, but you can see that since then, the sector has been slowly working out of it. Uh, occupancy rates are now just eclipsing 50% as of August. So coming back, leisure and hospitality jobs, I talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, they've fallen off a cliff. Uh, this is basically your hotels, your motels, and uh, any recreation that's going on in the valley, Magic Mountain, restaurants, and bars. And again, that's the hardest hit sector, uh, responsible for about a third of all job loss, a little bit more than that for that matter. When you look at professional technical in the scientific sector uh, and jobs they're in, hardly impacted at all. This sector was able to avoid many layoffs and furloughs, and a lot of these workers are working from home in these companies. Healthcare employment also, ditto, uh, did not decline much. Henry Mayo certainly announced some layoffs, not many, uh, but many of the other principal firms in this sector have avoided that. And so healthcare has been uh, relatively strong and will continue to be going forward. When you look at all the jobs that use office space, um, they didn't decline all that much relative to you know, retail and and the leisure hospitality sector. We're down about 2,000 jobs in the office sector. And when you look at office vacancy rates, they have ticked up some uh, going into the third quarter. This is data through August, so it's relatively fresh. So vacancy in the office sector has slowly moved up a little bit higher than it certainly was a couple of quarters ago and a year ago, but it's not at calamitous levels. So. Again, real estate assets have maintained a relatively strong performance, at least to date, in the Valley. Manufacturing employment um, is down to levels that we haven't seen since about 2013, but nevertheless has held on remarkably well. These are the companies that we've noticed uh, in the state reports that it announced layoffs over the last three or four months in the Santa Cruz Valley. The industrial sector, we've noticed in the third quarter of this year, even going into the second quarter, that vacancy rates for space in the Santa Clarita Valley have ticked up sharply uh, just, uh, just recently, as you can see, and the vacancy rate is now at about 9.1%. But is that due to the pandemic or is that due to the fact that there has been significant deliveries of new product in the industrial market uh, to Santa Clarita just in the last couple of years. When we look at this history, uh, that big spike was Gateway 5 in the IAC Commerce Center. Uh, and then recently, uh, Needham Ranch is responsible for most of the run-up. Uh, this year, we've seen 900,000 square feet delivered to the market in 14 different buildings. And I think with all that flood of space coming on, uh, and let, certainly, the demand being interrupted by the pandemic, we certainly have higher vacancy rates in industrial, but it will ultimately be absorbed uh, as we recover. When we look at all space under construction from all real estate categories, uh, we've seen a significant amount over time, particularly the last two, three years. This year, uh, there's been a respite, it's come down, but can, that's simply because we've had so many new deliveries. 
going forward, the forecast, the outlook for investment going on into non-residential, commercial, and industrial structures is a continuation of the trajectory that we've been on for the last several years during the recovery from the last recession. So uh, we look for a slight interruption this year, but continuing on next year. Remember, construction industry is an essential industry, and uh, it will continue. We're actually already seeing employment almost come back up to the levels it was pre-crisis. Housing production, too, uh, continues in the Valley, and uh, it is likely to continue on a much higher path over the next several years. Remember, there's a number of housing projects that are underway, including Valencia, which will deliver thousands of homes uh, going forward. Here's the summary for uh, our real estate market utilization and uh, the office market, the industrial market, the retail market. So we're at 10.2 and that's through August, 9.1 in the industrial market. 5.8 in the retail market and the apartment market is still quite tight really hasn't been affected much at all at 4.1 percent average rents continue to rise appreciation rate is 3.2 percent year over year through august of this year you can see the vacancy rates have been moving in a narrow path for many many years and currently are very very low uh, for the third quarter of this year. So again, apartment market's unaffected. And for that matter, the housing market generally unaffected. Median home selling prices have stayed uh, up there, uh, about consistent with where they've been for the last 12 months. And it's interesting to know that in July, we actually saw a breakout and median selling prices are now at all time record highs in the Santa Clarita Valley. When you look at home sales monthly, that's the January lows that normally occur because of the seasonality. And then home sales tick up. That's March of this year. Uh, but then the pandemic comes along and starts to lower home sales and we reach a low in May. <clears throat> but interestingly enough, we've seen a resurgence in June and July. So housing market has been very quick to recover. And we don't look for housing to slow anything down in the Santa Cruz Valley or for that matter in the rest of the state. So that's been a very resilient sector, needless to say. Let me go through the, uh, the forecast real quick. My time isn't infinite here, so I want to make sure I cover this. A summary for the U.S. and California. Uh, the national economy will continue to recover. Labor markets are going to create more jobs for the rest of this year but the rate of increase is gonna be a lot slower than May, June, July, and August, okay? Because uh, conditions, uh, while they'll, they will continue to improve, they won't improve at the alarming rates that we've seen uh, since the lockdowns ended. Many more layoffs will probably be coming in the hotel chains, uh, airlines, and anything travel related because travel uh, is not going to recover very well this year and probably going into the first part of next year. It won't be until next summer that we start to see travel really make big strides in recovery. And then the inability for schools to open in California together with the current very limited business environment for opening, that's gonna render the economy really unable to make much new progress towards recovery for the rest of 2020 and uh, it does limit the Santa Cruz Valley as well. Here's our GDP estimates for the nation. Uh, we are currently in the third quarter, so we're currently experiencing this huge rebound from uh, the second quarter calamity. Uh, so that's where we are, and that'll continue through this month. Then uh, October starts the fourth quarter. We'll see a lot less growth because we won't have as much uh, uh, to, to uh, cheer about because most things that are going to be open this year are open now nationwide. That stays in effect for the fourth quarter and the first quarter and then during the second quarter of next year we start to pick up significantly as more things are unrestricted and we start to get back to normal. Principal assumptions for California and the Santa Clarita Valley. Uh, California economy remains half open, essentially. It's where we are now. It's likely to be where it's going to stay. Schools are closed this fall. 
They're not going to be open. Some private schools are opening. Some private colleges are opening in, for in-person instruction. But for the most part, the schools are remaining shut. Uh, and that limits economic activity in general. Most of uh, the uh, population uh, uh, receives the vaccine, which is ready by either late this year or early in 2021. That's one of our principal presumptions for the forecast. And by the summer of next year, the pandemic ends. Okay, we have to give some kind of a scenario like that. And so we're indicating that restrictions and and limitations on the economy will last probably not to the extent that we're at now but will last in some to some extent for another year or so and then restrictions are limited during quarter two of next year and then completely by 2021 growth then begins to surge as a wider open economy occurs and consumers and households are simply going to be less reticent to publicly gather and do all the things that we used to do pre-crisis. So, California, which uh, is losing 1.5 million jobs this year, will recover about 700,000 next year and maybe another 600,000 the following year. In Santa Clarita, a similar profile is expected. We'll be down about 11,000 jobs this year, but we'll get about 4,500 back uh, next year and almost the same the following year, we will recover all jobs almost by the end of 2022 going into 2023. That's the scenario for the local area, um, given our assumptions. Unemployment rate, which is horrific now, uh, will sh fall sharply next year and will continue to fall as we make progress during the overall recovery. Construction employment is going to be a major engine of growth for the valley as will all the new development that is occurring in all real estate markets. So look for that to uh, create all kinds of new job opportunities uh, and new development potential going forward. Mortgage rates are not going to get in the way of housing at all. Uh, we're at uh, all time lows now, we'll continue to remain low in 2021 uh, and even for the next several years look for mortgage rates to remain around 4%, certainly not much more than that, given the commitments that the Fed has made for keeping the federal funds rate low uh, and the slack that's going to exist in the economy. Home selling values, uh, we just have them continuing along the same trajectory that they've been on for many, many years. So again, the real estate market doesn't really become impacted uh, by this pandemic. It'll take something else to interrupt that going forward. That is the principal forecast. Much of everything that what I've talked about right now is in our new supplemental uh, publication, a supplement to the March forecast that we put out. We know much more now and we have a better handle on how things are going to ensue over the next 18 months. So uh, make sure you take a look at that. <clears throat> it's our updated supplement. It's about five chapters, at least 36 pages. I'm still writing the executive summary, but it'll be finished today. Um, and it includes the updated forecast in a lot more glory. Okay, that is the overall outlook for the Santa Cruz Valley. Uh, and uh, we hope to meet again next year, but that time in person. So thank you, Holly. Thanks, Mark. And you're right. We absolutely hope that we are having a in-person meeting next year, which raises an interesting question. LA is so dependent on tourism and, and related events and SoFi Stadium and the Rams first game was done without any specter, spec, spectators. How does that play into the forecast for the LA region? It's huge, but then again, it plays into the forecast for all regions, right? Uh, because uh, those those same things are prohibited everywhere. So uh, and that's one of the reasons that the forecast for California isn't great. But uh, if we can retrieve about half of all next year to a wide open economy, uh, you're going to see some very impressive 
growth and that you'll see a surge, but the first half is not going to be uh, very good. So uh, and, unless we can expedite the uh, vaccine dissemination and we can get uh, the economy opened up sooner, we're certainly assuming that we're going to be closed down probably through the spring, but uh, to some extent. But if we can get things moving faster, and I guess things are moving at warp speed with respect to the vaccine, then look for a much better year in 2021. But but you're but you're right. All of those things that are limited now is what's playing into the fact that uh, we're going to have a very uh, unimpressive uh, rest of this year. You you talked about how the Jobs are coming back. I mean, at some pro- some portion of what was the what was lost. How much of that is due to the fiscal stimulus that was done versus and spending associated with that? And what do you think is the long term prognosis because we have incurred so much debt? Uh, certainly, the the stimulus provided households uh, with a lot of wherewithal provided a lot of unemployed with wherewithal they were out spending. They had to. Uh, so yes, that provided some job creation. And so with it, that all came to an abrupt halt at the end of August. So we're waiting to see if Congress uh, initiates another stimulus that could slow down and likely will slow down employment gains. And so we've incorporated that into our forecast for national employment creation over the next three or four months, because I don't know that we're going to get another stimulus. So it does impact that. uh, And that's one of the reasons why things don't grow as fast and the GDP forecast isn't as great. But uh, what your other question was in response to... Well, in order to generate that stimulus, we increased our government spending dramatically. People are asking about what the long-term consequence that that is? Well, the, the, I think the key word is what you said. They te- it tends to be a longer-term consequence. So right now, I don't think anyone is focusing on the fact that we've increased significant debt, and I don't think we necessarily need to be talking about that. That's one of those cans you can continue to kick down the road and worry about that later. Right now, I think the important issue is, is getting – uh, empl- uh, the unemployment down and getting the economy going again. And then we can worry about the debt issue in 2023, 2024. But you're right, it becomes a problem at that point in time. So we're either going to need to address that with reducing government spending significantly or increasing taxation uh, or causing the economy to grow so fast that uh, we increase uh, overall revenues for government significantly. But again, that's those are policies that will initiate probably after we end this pandemic and, and it looks like the recovery is going to be solid again. And then you've talked about the role that development and construction plays. There's going to be a lot of jobs there for the Santa Clarita Valley. How does that position us relative to other parts in Southern California, the state and the nation? Uh, just like it has for the last several years. It's positioning Santa Cruz so that uh, it will become a growth magnet going forward. Uh, so look for uh, all that new development to uh, bring in all new companies, new employees, new populations, new housing uh, that will cr- produce significant economic stimulus for the region. And uh, the growth of Santa Cruz will be miles ahead of so many other areas. We are seeing development booms in other markets in California. Uh, And so you're going to continue to see overall growth in California pick up, but it'll be spotty and by different regions. Certainly Santa Clarita will be much more competitive in that respect. Great. Well, Mark, thank you always for your insights and picking up on the presentations you've done previously. It's always great to hear from you. I'm sure. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to the next one. Bye, Holly. Dr. Schneep's updated forecast will be available for download on the SCV EDC website. I want to once again thank our presenters for their time today. Throughout the event, our sponsors have been shown on the screen, and we appreciate them deeply. This event would not be possible without them. 
You will be able to watch a video of this event on the SCV EDC YouTube page. And I encourage you to follow SCV EDC on all social channels and stay abreast of new company announcements, new development activity, and other new SCV EDC initiatives. Finally, I want to thank you for attending today's event. I hope you have a wonderful evening.